Hey guys, I want to thank you for joining me for this first episode in Season 5 of Good Questions with Cameron Dole. My name is Cameron Dole and my special guests today include author and podcast host Sarah Bragg. We'll be talking about her latest release, plus comedian Brad Williams. He's got an upcoming show at the Hudeberg Chevrolet Center in Midwest City, Oklahoma, coming up on April 17th. We'll be talking about that as well. Of course, as always, I'll take a look at some of the highlights or lowlights that are going on around the world as well. And I would appreciate it if you would uh, subscribe. And if you like what you hear, be sure and share with your friends. And I would appreciate a, uh, a, a review if you would as well. Of course, if you uh, have inspiration, maybe have an idea of a guest that could come on the show, you can always drop me an email. We keep it real simple for you. It's gqwithcam at gmail.com. Well, going to take a look at uh, a story before we have our first guest, Sarah Bragg. And, you know, I want to take care of you health-wise as well. And uh, I'm going to share any of those that, uh, that, that suit me well, like this story. Turns out intermittent fasting has become a popular way to lose weight the last few years, but a new study has found that it could end up giving you a heart attack. Researchers looked at the health records of more than 20,000 adults over 15 years and found a 91% higher risk of dying from cardiovascular disease. Now that's the number for people who followed a 16 to 8 eating schedule. That means all your meals are an eight hour window and you fast for 16 hours. Now it's not clear why that would be the case since other research has found intermittent fasting can lower blood pressure and cholesterol. They noted that the study didn't prove anything, they just found an association between an eight hour eating window and cardiovascular death. So you might wanna take this with a grain of salt or even skip the salt though because too much sodium can also cause heart disease all right guys promised you another very special guest and uh, man alive where does time fly and uh, i think it, it talks about the uh, the time in life that we're at sarah uh it, it's been two and a half almost three years since our last visit and uh, we've we got a great book to talk about and uh, i think this is where a lot of us in this stage of life are at, and uh, Sarah, I'm looking forward to talking about it. Sarah Bragg, our guest today. I am so glad to be back when I saw your name come through my inbox. I, was, I enjoyed our last conversation, so I was happy to get to come back on. Now, now tell us uh, the, the new book, uh, Offering an Action Plan to Become Happier. That's what that's what the headline on the email was, uh, was, <laughs> was for me, and I was like, I think I could use that. I think I could right, use that. Right. Tell, tell us where where the book came from uh, and, and where the struggle, because the struggle's real. Yeah, you know, I found myself in this season of life. You and I are talking earlier just about this this phase of life, this midlife, and I feel like there's just a lot of tensions that we feel. And so I was sitting down. I, I knew there was another book that you know needed to be written, and and I just was feeling in a hard place of just feeling lost. And I, I just sat down with like a pen and like a storyboard. And I was like, what do I feel right now? And like, it was lonely and exhausted and unhappy and disconnected. It was all these like feelings. I mean, happiness was not on the board at all. <laughs> and I was like, but I want to feel happy. Like I, I want to feel happy about where I am in life and who I am in this season and how things have changed or evolved and so I just started digging in with that of like, what does that then look like? And the more I started looking into it, I feel like happiness was really coming down to connection mm. and finding that sense of connection, not only with others, but just with ourselves. And so I just really started unpacking all of those feelings that I was feeling, which I don't really like to feel things. I, I kind of <laughs> want to think them and acknowledge them and then, oh, let's just move on. Let's don't deal with that. And so I just started really asking a lot of questions and and looking at the questions that I was asking that were connected to those feelings. Like, does anybody like me? And do I matter anymore? Am I invisible? You know, am I happy? And I just thought, I think there, this is what I need to write about. I don't have a magic bullet or a magic pill for happiness, but 
I do think there's some things that we can start doing in life, you know, on a daily basis that can maybe bring a little more happiness along the way. Now, what was what was maybe the big the big eye opener as uh, as you were going through, or or maybe that that led to the to the ultimate starting of the book, maybe. Yeah, I think I started realizing that I I was well. First of all, this season of life, I I don't know if you feel this way, but I feel like I lose a lot of sleep. I, I wake oh. up and then I'm just kind of awake, and then I go through a rolodex of all the fears that I think about, and and so that's really where this was coming from. And I really just started to realize a lot of these things that I ruminate on and wrestle with have a lot of to do with myself kind of getting in the way. And, and so like, even when it comes to, you know, is everyone happier than me? A lot of that angst is just me showing up on social media and looking at all the things that everybody else is doing and has. And it seems to be that I'm ultimately missing out and don't have as good of a life. And okay, well, how am I getting in the way of that? Well, comparison gets in the way, you know, like I'm, I'm not being creative anymore because I'm afraid that I won't achieve in my own creativity, all these things. And so the more I started looking at those things and then I would get curious about it and go, oh, well, what am I doing that is getting in the way? And what can I then kind of build into my life to find that sense of happiness? Mm-hmm. For you to find it in yourself, uh, I, I think that's the, the thing for me, gone through so much, so much loss uh, trying to find happiness inside. How hard was that? And is that still a daily battle for you as well? I, I do think that's hard for everyone. I think that again, there's, there's no magic, you know, pill that you can take. There's, you know, happiness is just like any other feeling. So, you know, it's going to ebb and flow and that's not a bad thing. That's just how feelings are. Right. And so, it's the work that comes to always coming back to, okay, what am I, is there something that I'm doing that's getting in the way or doing the the work of gratitude of really having to open my eyes and go, well, look around, like there's still something good here. Not that good has to come out of a bad situation or out of loss. Like that's, that still hurts, but it's looking around and going, okay, like this is really cool that I get to have this interview with Cameron today, like who else is getting to do that today? Like, this is great. This is fun. Like just the little ordinary things and finding some sense of happiness in all these little ways. It does take some work and it does, you know, there's days where I'm still more miserable than I am happy. Um, (laughs) But, but I do think it's, it's just those daily choices you got to make. And and the, the, the keeping up with the Joneses, how hard is it? And I think that's something well, obviously, it's a it's a, a a saying that we've heard our whole lives, so it's been around for a minute. Why? Uh, what what can we do not to keep up with the Joneses? Oh man, <laughs> it, isn't it funny how that has been around forever? <laughs> but I just feel like it's taken on a whole new level now. Oh, like my. I just asked my my thirteen year old. Mm-hmm. You know, we were at the mall, and she was you know wanting all these things, and I was like, "Do you ever just get tired of like?" keeping up with everyone and looking like everyone that every single 13 year old girls is wearing Nikes and carrying a Stanley. And like, is, you just get tired of it ever. And she's like, no, what are you talking about? Like, I was like, okay, whatever. We'll cover that another time. But I do think that the whole social media has just upped that game of comparison. It's just in your face. Like, and that's just where we all are. That's where we live. I, I think for me, you know, one of the biggest things that has helped me with um, not trying to keep up with the Joneses is setting up guardrails. So the biggest guardrail for me is just time. So I took about a four month hiatus from social media and which is so funny that sounds really short, but it also felt very long to take four months (laughs) off. But man, I honestly have never been happier. Like it forced me to, um, if I wanted to know about someone's life, to actually talk to that person, to reach out to that person, you know, whether it was a text or a call or to get together in person. Um, But it it forced that. I looked at how much time I was spending on it. I started reading more books. I think last year or was it last year I read 72 books and I'm like, Oh my goodness. That's because I all of a sudden had, I realized the time suck that it was. And so just setting up those guardrails of realizing 
I, if I'm on this too much, I immediately start thinking my life is less than, or I start getting really like, angry and judgy at other people and going, Oh, look at them. Like, and none of this is good. None of this is like, <laughs> makes me feel good. And so setting up some kind of guardrail, whether it was like literally taking like time off, took the app off my phone, not even checking it. Or now I set like a time limit, just like I do with my teenage girls. I'm like, this is how you know I get 30 minutes a day on Instagram. And this is, you got to do your, do your life in this moment. And otherwise it's just that time goes so quickly and then you spiral downward the comparison the ah oh, i don't have enough or they're so much better and so really guardrails has been the best thing to set up around that and uh it, also at this time of life we we tend to uh, i hear a lot of my friends doing this is like you know, it didn't turn out quite well, the, the way I thought I, it was going to turn out and and you start thinking about that too and but that doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing. It just means, you know, life happened. You know, that's, I, I feel like that is one thing that I am constantly working on is being able to, to look back on what was and what could have been. And if there's feelings of grief around that, being able to be sad for what didn't happen or what isn't going to happen and learning to be okay with where we are. I think that's got to be one of the hardest lessons about midlife is realizing, oh, I really thought life was going to be like this, or I thought I would achieve this by this point, and it's just not going to happen. Um, I think that's a really hard practice of coming back to you and trying to find a sense of peace with where you are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, what, uh, what have you found works best for you? Do, do you have to start early in the day mentally prepping yourself for happiness? Well, it's probably personality driven, I bet. But I I think for me, the times where I do best, it really is starting the day in that sense of I, I, I'm a journaler. Maybe other people aren't. I don't even I don't even know. I, I just heard that someone had like a master class of journaling. I'm like, oh I didn't know like you need to learn how to I just write <laughs> some stuff. Like it, there's no rhyme or reason to it. I just kind of word vomit onto a page of what's like filling my mind. And I, you know, um, but it is, I, I write down every day. Well, not every day. Let's, let's be honest. And, you know, most days a week I'm writing the, the words thankful for. And then I think back to the day before what made me smile and little things. And just, you know, it could be two things that day. It could be 10. There's no rhyme or reason, but I do think starting your day like that is really helpful to setting yourself up for some success. And at least it puts your perspective in the right way. And then of course, you know, life happens and you know, you, you see something or something happens like, and you can't control that, but it's coming back to that coming back. Like if I need to come back to that, um, or sometimes it's literally just physiologically, like I just need to like, um, move my body or I need to, you know, do something physical that helps me go. Okay. Like it's okay. Like it's okay that that didn't turn out the way you wanted it to turn out, but move your body in such a way that my body like keeps up like with my brain where it needs to be. That's funny. And, uh, I, I love your cat. That made yeah. me smile so big. <laughs> yeah, Finnegan, Finnegan made an appearance. Uh, there's, there's Finnegan, never a that's any a good telling, name. never any telling who may show up, but, uh, <laughs> And how much, you know, we can't rely completely on ourselves. And I think that's probably one of the things that, that has been such a struggle for me is not wanting to share the grief and the pain and, and the feelings with others, but still needing that connection. I mean, I mean, yeah. where's, where's that mid, where's that midpoint, if you will. Yeah. And, you know, the same as I, I feel like my husband and I, we, we have conversations about that very thing. I mean, I love Penny and he's like, I want all your love. <laughs> yes, he does. All the time. All the time. But, you know, I don't think you have to have like 15 people at your beck and call that know you so intimately and that you share those hard things with. But I feel like, man, if you have one, that's a really great place. Um, and two, you're doing really great. But I do think... The times where I've tried to keep it all in and not let someone in on those parts of me, which are very vulnerable, you know, like to, to open yourself up to those things, they're, they're vulnerable things. And so you're, you're kind of like, is someone going to be like, Ooh, she should really like get some therapy. Like, you know, like, who knows like what you think someone's going to think. 
Um, but the times that you actually do reach out and just say the words out loud, I think that that energy that that just brings a certain connection that is pretty powerful for helping not only just feel seen that like, okay, like someone knows what I'm going through, but, but then to maybe be able to find some happiness and step forward is keeping it all inside. Yeah. It just festers and it becomes even more lonely than what you probably already feel in those ways. Now the, the, the process of writing the book, how, how long was, was the process from, from beginning to end? And then how long from then to, the fruition to, to, uh, release week that we're coming up on as well. Oh man, it was a long time, Cameron. <laughs> it was a long journey. It was, you know, and, and what's I, I, that my first book, a mother's guide to raising herself came out in August of 21. Mm-hmm. And I sort of expected to turn around and start writing the next thing in like October of 21. And I was in such a hard place. Mm-hmm. I was in a place of burnout and, you know, coming off the heels of the pandemic. And then we moved states at the end of 2020. So my girls were starting new schools and launching the book and, you know, just all adapting to change. And I was feeling a lot of things, even professionally with like my podcast and what I was feeling about it. And I was just so burnt out that writing just was not happening. Like I, and I just couldn't put words together to form sentences that even made sense or seemed helpful. And so I really just kind of worked on life for the next year. And I started trying to do things that made me happy, that were fun, that just, you know, moved my body. I went back to things that I once loved. And and I feel like over time of doing those things and reaching out to friends and having coffee and doing all of that, the word started coming and it started, the, the idea started coming together. And so once I knew what I was going after that chart of all those feelings and I started thinking, I think, I, I think I know where I'm going. You know, I think I wrote the book in about two months and wow. just, just fleshed it all out. And, um, and then, but you know, for start to finish for, for books, it's, it's usually about a year at least, if not longer from like the moment they say, yeah, go green light, write the book to the time that it comes out. It's maybe a year and a half even. So it's, it's a long journey for sure. No, now how, how has, how has everything changed this go around? Uh, I mean, like you said, last time we were coming out of the pandemic, I mean, how has, how does the, the, the outlook, I mean, uh, how, yeah. how much different is the positivity outlook, if you will? Yeah, I, I definitely feel Like I've put less pressure on myself. Mm. I felt like, you know, we're all coming out of 2020. We're all just a little like pent up and like angsty and like, oh my gosh, like is the world ending? You know, we're all carrying all of those feelings. And so I feel like this time around after walking through a couple of really just hard years of the midlife moments, (laughs) I feel like this time around I've carried what I do with less stress and pressure one of my favorite books is Big Magic by Elizabeth Gilbert. Mm-hmm. And I always reread it when I'm writing. There's something about it that just really helps me. It's on creativity. And there was a part in that book where she talked about um, whatever you're doing, whatever you're working on, your creative outlet. She's like, it's okay if it doesn't change the world. And it's okay if it doesn't change everyone's lives. And it's, it's okay if it doesn't matter in this big grand way. And something about that just clicked and it was what I needed to hear. Like, obviously I I hope that this is so meaningful to somebody and helpful to somebody, but it was, the point was to follow where that led me. And this was my create creative work that was stored inside that needed to get out and it was meaningful to me. And so that, pressure like is not there of, Oh man, it's got to like do this great thing. Obviously I want it to do great things. Like I want to, you know, write more books. Like we've got to like, you know, it's got to be successful in some sense to keep doing what I'm doing, but I just don't feel as much pressure on myself to be this certain person. And so I just feel like I'm enjoying the whole process more than I did the last time around. That's cool. And, and and being settled in a, in a new place, I, I know how much, 
That means I, I, we've, like I said, we've been here two, it'll be two years in April and we're just now, I think finally, uh, getting a little comfort, comfortable in our environments. And I, I can't imagine yours being any different. Yes, it's exactly the same. Same. I mean, we probably moved not that long after, or not like long before mm. that you moved. So it really is. It's funny that it takes so long. <laughs> I want everything to be instant. Let's be honest. You know, like lose five pounds instantly. Like you know, be settled instantly. Like, right. but it's just not really how life works. <laughs> That's right. Now, uh, Sarah, if if folks want to find uh, more information uh, about the book, uh, about the podcast, about you got so many things going on as well. Where's where's the best place for folks to to find out? Yeah, best place is probably my website, mm-hmm. sarahbragg.com. So it's s a r a h b r a g g dot com and links to the podcast, links to the books, all that sort of thing. Um, a newsletter that I send out every month, you can sign up for that there. So it's all, it's all on the website. That's cool. Now, now Sarah, what is, uh, what's, uh, what's next? What's the, the next project you're working on, whether, whether it be book or, or, or otherwise? Well, I, I do want to write more. So I'm, I'm mulling about and thinking about what another book might be. I would love to write fiction one day, but man, that feels so hard. I don't know. I had, I have a friend who writes fiction and she's like, no, like writing nonfiction, you can't just kill off the main character because you're the main character. You just can't like, well, we're over the story ends. Like she's like, at least in fiction, you can, oh, I don't like that character anymore. Let's just like, you know, kill off that character. But I would love, I just want to keep being creative in that way. I'm helping my parents, but they have a wedding venue. And so I've started helping them out and that's been kind of a creative muscle to get to flex with that. And so, um, so yeah, so I'm just kind of dabbling in a lot of different things in, in this time. Well, that's cool. Well, Sarah, the, the new book is everyone happier than me. Be sure and uh, check that out. Looking forward to, to spending some more time with that. And uh, Sarah, I look forward to catching up again real soon, my friend same. Thank you for having me again. Well, as our final guest on the episode is comedian Brad Williams. Got a couple of funny or, well, odd stories for you, if you will. I'll share one before and one after we have Brad Williams. And uh, this one, is this guy a psycho or the best dad ever? He might be both. A 37-year-old dad in Ohio named Adam Sizemore is facing charges after he kept calling his son's school to complain that they were giving the kid too much homework. He called the elementary school over and over on February 9th and March 1st to say his son had so much homework they didn't have time to hang out. Now that's kind of sweet, except he was verbally abusive to the staff and used vulgar language. They say he threatened the principal at one point and told him that he better quote, put his big boy pants on. Now the school eventually stopped picking up, so Adam called his local police department. And not just once, but 18 times. Now, he kept asking to talk to the chief of police and said things like, I pay your salary. They did put him through, but he got his voicemail and kept calling back. They told him he could come down to the station and talk to him in person, but he demanded the chief of police come to his home instead. Now, that didn't happen, but several officers did show up to arrest him. They charged him with menacing and telecommunications harassment both misdemeanors. It's been a minute since I've talked to a, a stand-up comedian, but excited to talk to Brad Williams. And uh, Brad got an upcoming show at the Hudeberg Chevrolet Center coming up April 17th. And Brad, first off, it's it's a privilege to visit with you and, uh, and nice to meet you, bud. Hey, nice to talk to you. Uh, so yeah, it's been, it's been a while since you've talked to a comedian. I imagine it's been even longer uh, since you've talked to a dwarf, unless you have a uh, history on uh, Pornhub that I'm not aware of. <laughs> I, I do not. And and that was actually, you know, one of the things leading up, I was like, you know, I don't think I've ever spoken to, I, I, I don't think, I think maybe actually I'll take that back. I interviewed Vern Tro- Troyer back a few years ago. So 
Uh, I've got one. I've got one in the coffer from from several years ago, well, if you will. Well, well, that's a hell of a little person to get. I mean, I I'm I'm hesitant to say that there's a dwarf Mount Rushmore because a mount uh, uh, <laughs> connotes that it's big. So, but if, if there's an ant hill Rushmore of little people, Vern might be on that thing. <laughs> now, now, Brad, where did uh, where, where did comedy uh, and Hammond it up? I mean, was that something that was uh, that w- was always easy for you? Something that that you were always stirring stuff up as a youngster as well? Absolutely. Uh, the thing is, is as a little person, I was always taught by my dad, "Hey, people are going to stare at you." no matter what. So my, so might as well just have a joke ready, um, make them feel comfortable and just know that you're good. You're going to get a lot of attention. So if you have a lot of attention, might as well do something with it. And I, I found that humor was a great way to make people comfortable and also keep me out of trouble in terms of fights with bullies because, uh, man, uh, some people would think that they, could come at me and I was an easy target and uh, they found out real quick that I wasn't. Um, I made a kid cry on the very first day of school. I will never forget this. A kid come up, a, a kid came up, he had just moved to the school district and he, I guess he wanted to make a name for himself. So he saw me and saw a weak target and walked up to me. This was in kindergarten. And he just said, ha ha, you're little. And I said, ha ha, your mom doesn't live with your dad anymore. Oh. And <laughs> And he started crying. <laughs> and then, um, I got sent to the principal's office for having the better joke. And the principal knew my dad, and he knew that when he called uh, my dad up, that he wasn't going to have a problem with what I did. So uh, that's that's kind of how I got started. So es- essentially, I've been performing my entire life. So being in front of a, a 1,200 people or so in, in Oklahoma, that's just a – that. That's just another day. Right now. Now, what has that uh, as you look? I mean, you, you've been doing this for a minute. What uh, what has been maybe one of those things that you kind of hang your hat on as saying, look what I've been able to accomplish? Or, or do you even do that or set goals for the for the coming years as well? You know what? Yeah, I've been doing this for 20 years now, which is about 35 and dwarf. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I try not to look at that. But at the same time, I do think it's important to stop every now and then and take a step back and go like, wow, like uh, I'm doing it. Like, can you name another dwarf comedian that's been selling out theaters? Like not really. So uh, this is kind of, I'm kind of the first to do this. Uh, so it's really an honor and it's just really exciting. And whenever I come to a city and I just see those little blue dots on the website go away, which means, you know, seats are being filled. It's all. It's always a trip, man. I I don't take it lightly. I know that people when they go out now, you know they're they're spending their hard earned money. They're getting a babysitter. Uh, they're they're put they're putting on a nice dress, a nice shirt, and they're going out and they're ready to laugh. So I take my responsibilities very, uh, very seriously. And I and I and I love the people of Oklahoma to give you an idea that I'm not BSing. I have two ex, I I have two exes that live in Oklahoma. <laughs> So, uh, I do, I, I do love the good people of Oklahoma and who knows if you see an attractive dwarf female in the audience of the, of, of the show, <laughs> it might be, it might be an ex-girlfriend. I might be getting some really interesting heckles that night. Now, now one of the, one of the cool things is I was looking at, at the bio and some of the things that you've done. Uh, I think you've got one of those things that I don't know of any other comedian that, uh, that headlined. A Cirque, Sol- Cirque du Soleil show. I mean, and, and how did that happen? And and what was that run like? Well, uh, first of all, thank you. And secondly, uh, as my dad told me when, when when I got the job, he said, well, it's only natural that a dwarf ends up in the circus. <laughs> uh, so, you know what? They called me and I love a challenge. And when they said, hey, we want you, we, we want you to do comedy at a Cirque du Soleil show, that's never been done before. And, uh, I thought, yeah, let me do it. And, and just to be clear, I was doing stand up. I was doing what I do naturally. I wasn't being fired out of a cannon yelling, <laughs> we, we, as I flew across the stage. Uh, so it, 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 it was a challenge. And I asked them, well, this is Circus Soleil show. It's the first time you guys have done comedy. We're in front of an, we're in front of audiences that aren't necessarily comedy club audiences. Mm-hmm. They go, what's my, 
what's my rules for material? And I remember the director of the show just said, your rules are to be funny. That is all that, that is all you got. And when I got that, that was the green light. I thought, well, this is going to be fun. And to, to, to give you an idea of what people think of stand up comedy or just speaking in public in general, uh, there, uh, one night the power, uh, went out, the, the light board went out at, at the show, 12, 1200 seat theater. It's, it's sold out. The power goes out. They have to restart the thing. And when they restart the thing, it takes about seven to 10 minutes to boot, to, to boot back up again. And there's just nothing going on on the stage. I run to the side of the stage and I go, somebody hand me a microphone, turn a microphone on, hand me a microphone. They did. I walked up on stage and then with no lights, I, I just started go nuts and doing stand up, and I'm used to doing an hour so it, it was fine it was easy for me and I and I walk backstage after I get the crowd going again and we have a guy in the cast who's a Russian hand balancer he goes on top of about a three story building and balances on his two hands nothing holds him up except his palms and he's doing tricks and everything it's unbelievable to watch and when I walked backstage, this Russian hand balancer looked at me and goes, I have no idea how you do what you do. <laughs> and that just shows you what people think of stand up comedy because, I mean, if I tell a joke and it doesn't go well, oh well, the joke bombed. I have another joke coming. If that guy doesn't do well, he uh. dies. So uh, it, it, it's, it, it's just kind of the way it goes, but I like doing things that scare me. I like doing things that are new, that are exciting. That's why this tour that I'm on currently is so, is so exciting. I, I haven't done a whole national and now we, we just announced worldwide <laughs> tour, uh, before and, uh, it's going great. Pe people are coming out there. They're filling the seats and I'm giving them a story because when they go back to work, they, they could, you know, when people say, Hey, what'd you do over the weekend? You get to say a dwarf told me jokes. How many people get to say that that aren't kings of England from the 1400s? Right. Now, now, now mm -hmm. Brad, for, for you, what uh, what is the biggest change you've seen over the last five years? I mean, I, I know 2020 changed everybody and it changed everything. Sure. But but as far as comedy, I mean, I know it slowed some things down, but did, what kind of uh, inspiration did that give you maybe to, to, to branch out what you did a little bit? Oh, man. Uh, 2020 was such an interesting time in comedy because, like you mentioned, it shut everything down except for uh, a couple of us that were out doing shows. In fact, this is real. Uh, I was the first comic along with a comedian named Jeff Dye. We, we were the first comics to be back on the road in 2020. Uh, Jeff went to Salt Lake city and I went to Oklahoma city, uh, the go. Bricktown, the Bricktown comedy club, which is a great comedy yeah. club. They, they separated everybody out. We did one third capacity and uh, we, we started doing comedy again. This was in May. So just two months wow. after the lockdown started. And uh, so uh, Oklahoma will always have a special place <laughs> in my heart for that reason and, and, and many others. But to really answer your question, when comedy shut down and then when it opened back up again, it's like, it, it, like it, it, if you know <laughs> how a large explosion happens, it's not everything bursts out. It's everything goes in first. Right. Everything gets sucked in first and then bursts out. And that's what I felt happened with comedy during the lockdown. Everyone got sucked in. They all went inside. Everyone was locked down. And then when it bursted back out again, Holy crap, is it an explosion? Now you have so many comedians that are like selling out stadiums, you know, basketball stadiums, yeah. some baseball stadiums and many, and many comedians doing theaters and I, I think it's just people were inside and now they want to go out and there's so many places where we're not allowed to say certain things nowadays. You're not allowed yeah. to say things at your job, not allowed to say things as a public figure, not allowed to say things at uh, parties. Now you could argue if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but <laughs> I think people want that. They crave that. And stand up comedy is still a place where uh, you can say those things, hear those things, and laugh at those things. And it, and it all comes from a point of joy. Like, it's just, I'm trying to bring happiness. And, because I get asked sometimes, go, what do you think about this whole 
cancel culture thing in comedy. I go, Dave Chappelle has been canceled like three times, <laughs> and and that and that dude could sell out uh, OU Stadium if he wanted Easily. to. So if that's so so if that's what it means to be canceled, cancel me by all means, please. Give me a little cancellation notice, please. Give me my pink slip. <laughs> yeah, uh, Shane, Shane, Shane Gillis got canceled, and then he got to host Saturday Night Live. And he's got a show on Netflix, and he's selling out all over. Yeah. Please, by all means, cancel me. And that and that's something you know. Uh, I told you, I've talked with a lot of comedians over the years. Judy Gold and I were talking, uh, and she wrote the book about it. If if uh, if they were trying to cancel comedy, which it seemed like for a bit that was going to happen, but but like you said, they've tried to cancel uh, Dave so many times, and and he just yeah. grows every time. Yeah, and 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 what a wonderful voice of comedy to have that conversation with. Uh, Judy Gold is fantastic, <laughs> and. Uh, the absolute physical opposite of me for people who don't know Judy gold. Uh, she's about a six foot tall Jewish woman from New York. I'm a four foot tall, uh, a white dude from orange County, California. You couldn't get more different than us. But I tell, I tell you what, that's what's so wonderful about comedy is comedy is a uniter. People want to say that comedy divides people. It absolutely does not. It brings all types of people together. Everyone can come together laugh at a joke, whether it be inappropriate or not, and just have a lot of fun. And I don't know too many outlets that are allowing people to do that. So I'm thankful to be a stand-up comedian and can't wait to share that with the good people of Oklahoma. That's right. Now, now, Brad, what is uh, what is a rough night? Uh, say, say you've had a, a, a tough day. Th- everything's gone terrible. They And you got about five, ten minutes before they hand you the mic. How how do, how does Brad focus in before uh, before stepping in front of the spotlight? Man, I hate saying this because I don't want to jinx it, but <laughs> the people of Oklahoma should hope that I have a bad that I have a bad day. They 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 should hope that I have a bad day the day of, the day of the show because for me co- uh, comedy is that outlet. Yeah. If I'm I've noticed this and it. I, I don't like even putting it out there in the universe, but I've noticed that when I'm upset, when I'm angry, I have the best show of my life that night. So uh, if anyone in Oklahoma knows my wife, just have that call my wife, tell her, Hey, just make Brad mad the day, the day of the show, you know, complain again that I'm on the road or that things aren't getting done around the house. And then, Oh, I am going to kill it that night. So comedy in that way is my therapy. It's what, it's what I use. It, it, it's where I can vent. And if I'm a little bit upset, oh, you're going to hear some venting. <laughs> and Brad, Brad, who who inspires you? Who inspires your comedy? Uh, maybe their styles uh, motivate you, or or you just get that uh, inspiration inside that that that, de- that you just can't put away, if you will. Man, there are so many great comedians, not only working today, but just all time that I look at. Like all time, I love a guy like. Robin Williams, who just had nonstop energy, yeah. which I kind of try to do on stage. Uh, e- even if you want to go older, I look at a guy like Jonathan Winters, yeah. uh, that, that w- a great uh, improvisational oh, comic. Yeah. But if you look at nowadays, man, Bill Burr, Jim Jeffries, Shane Gillis, uh, even someone like Taylor Tomlinson, mm-hmm. that who is really just blown up and is about 12 years younger than me, which is crazy to say, <laughs> but uh, she is just so funny and she opens up so much on stage and she gives a perspective that um, hasn't really been seen a lot on stage. And so I'm really liking that and I relate to that because I'm giving a perspective that is also something that not, that not a lot of people have seen before. So uh, those are the those are the comics right now that I'm that I'm looking at like wow they're really doing it and it's awesome. And, and Brad, you, you talked about the, the the good times and all that stuff. What is uh, what what were the hardest times and and uh, as as you were trying to get this thing going uh, and who was there in your corner that kept you going when you wanted to just pack it in, if you will. <laughs> Man, uh, well the thing that always kept me going was the fact that I, that I dropped out of college to do this. Uh, so I knew that if I, 
quit comedy. That means that that means a I was wrong, and darn it, I hate being wrong. <laughs> and then I had to go back to college. With some people had an amazing college experience. I had a pretty good one. I'm not going to lie, but uh, uh, it, I didn't. I never liked school, so yeah. uh, uh, I liked I I liked doing this. But so uh, I tell you, right uh, at about 2017, 2018. Um, I had to, I decided to quit comedy and try being a, uh, morning show radio DJ. Are you familiar with the profession? <laughs> uh, uh, just, sli- <laughs> just slightly. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I tried doing that and I lasted, uh, God bless you and for what you've done and what you've built and how, ha- and how you continue to do it. Because I tried to do that. I lasted about three months and, <laughs> <laughs> and they're pretty, it was the waking up early. It was, uh, you know, this is a little insider information that you'll understand, but yeah. it, 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 it was the program director telling me how to be funny. <laughs> uh, it, it, see, exactly. And uh, it, it, it was that that just made me realize that a bad day in stand up comedy is better than even a good day at some other jobs. So uh, that's, that's what keeps me going is that I always look at it and go, e- e- even if I have a bad day, I, I, I go, hey, I've done some great things. I've accomplished some great things. I'm going to continue to do great things. And if, you know, uh, uh, three days ago, uh, I was at the New Orleans airport for about 10 hours because of delays. Yeah. Because of delays and cancellations and weather and all that jazz. So that's not a great day, but at the same time, you just kind of look at it and go, well, the day, the day before, I was shooting a movie, and uh, I, I got to be in the great city of New Orleans and eat some really great food. So you just kind of look at what comedy has brought me, and then it's pretty hard to complain when when I got to stick it around in an airport and eat some airport lounge food for a few hours and, <laughs> and, and watch Netflix. Oh, darn. Right. Uh, somebody's got to do it, man. Brad, somebody's got to rough it, you know? Might as well be here. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I, I did. I didn't. I would be remiss if I didn't mention this. As my the the big thing that sold me on uh, on doing the interview was was uh, the intro I got in an email, and I and I would be remiss if I didn't share this one. It said uh, okay. they were they were offering me comedian Brad Williams, who has been called Prozac with a head by Robin Williams, and <laughs> it, it, but this is the this is the catcher. He says he's going to bring his latest tour, appropriately titled. Tour 24. And I was like, I got it. I can't. Wh- how can I say no? How can I say no? It's appropriately titled Tour 24. <laughs> you know, uh, some comics, when they name their tours, it's the Can't Get Enough Tour or the Won't Ever Stop Tour or the, you know, name your, name your cliche. For me, we're in the year 2024. It rhymes. It's simple. It's easy to remember. I'm a simple man. My mom's from Georgia. My dad's from Texas. Uh, I like things simple. So, uh, yeah, I just kept the name of the tour simple. And I don't need to, I didn't need to make a pun like the little voice tour or the think big tour or anything like that. So yeah, just tour, just tour, tour 24, get the job done and, um, bring it to Oklahoma in April. Can't, Wait. That, that's right. Well, Brad, I always want to make sure and let everybody know where uh, to keep up with everything. I know uh, you got website, social media, all that. Uh, where's the best place to keep yeah. up with you? BradWilliamsComedy.com. That's got the links to the Facebook, the Twitter, the Instagram, all that. Uh, follow me on those. But most importantly, just see what I do. See what I see what I do and see what I do well and see what I'm really good at. And uh, come out to see me in Oklahoma on, I believe it's April 17th on a Wednesday. That is Hudeberg Chevrolet Center, April 17th. Doors open 6 o'clock. Uh, show at 7 o'clock. Uh, looking forward to that one, brother. Yeah, and uh, that, and pe- pe- people, I really am thankful for the fans. So when the show is done, I'll do a free meet and greet after the show. It doesn't cost you any extra. You don't got to pay a fee to take a crappy Polaroid with me. <laughs> no. Just line up at the end of the show, and I'll meet anyone and everyone that wants to come say hi, and uh, really thank you and, and and everyone who buys the ticket because uh, you're paying the mortgage, everybody. So thank you. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, Brad, look forward to seeing you in a couple weeks. Uh, thank you for your time, and we'll see you next month. Can't wait. Thank you so much.
Again, I do want to say thanks to our special guests, Sarah Bragg and Brad Williams. Of course, uh, check them out, sarahbragg.com and bradwilliamscomedy.com online. And of course, if you ever have an idea for a guest, you can always drop me an email, gqwithcam at gmail.com. And don't forget to drop a rating for us uh, on whatever platform that you're on and share with any friends well told you we had another story for you and uh, with brad williams we'll wrap the story the uh, the the episode up with another museful story if you will from around the world and uh well if you're a real estate agent there are a few tips and tricks to success and one of them is you don't want to burn the place down A real estate agent in Australia got in some hot water a while back when she accidentally burned a multi-million dollar property to the ground while preparing for an open house. Now, the house had renters at the time and the agent was running around tidying a few things up. She noticed some bedding that was hanging out back to dry and thought it looked bad, so she balled it up, took it downstairs and threw it on a shelf under a lamp. She then turned that light on. Well, about 20 minutes later, a major fire broke out and a majority of the house was burned down to the studs. Now, they later determined that it started because of the bedding and the basement light. Apparently, the light heated the blankets up, which were right up against it. They caught fire and it tore through the house. Now, this happened a few years back and the case was just decided in court. The owner told a judge that the real estate agent admitted it was her fault, telling him, Oh my God, I think I have burnt down your house. She even suggested that it was the bedding that probably did it. But in court, she argued that the owner and the renters were also to blame because she wasn't aware the lamp would cause anything on the shelf to heat up like that. In the end, the court ruled that the real estate agent's negligence was at fault, saying, She actively created the risk of fire and the consequent harm. The company she worked for was ordered to pay damages to both the homeowner and the renters who lost all their belongings in the fire. Well, again, I do want to say thanks for joining us on this first episode in Season 5 of Good Questions with Cameron Dole. Of course, uh, we appreciate any comments, questions, uh, and if there's anything else you'd like to know, you can hit me up on any of the socials, Instagram, X, formerly Twitter, TikTok, and Facebook. Look me up at the Cameron Dole. And if you have a special guest idea, like I said, you can email me, gqwithcam at gmail.com. We would also appreciate any ratings on those podcast platforms as well. Well, our good friend Brandon Allen came up with our theme music a long time ago for us. And uh, be remiss if we didn't give him a a hats up, if you will. Brandon, thanks for the music. We're going to let him play us out. And we look forward to talking to you on our next episode.